Hello, I'm Franz Spohn for FlexCut Tools. I'm here today to show you FlexCut's Lino and Relief printmaking set. Let's go to the studio. Well, now that we're in the studio, um, I want to look at my FlexCut carving tools. This is the Lino and Relief printmaking set. And I'll just open it up. And inside there is a sharpening strop and a tool roll up. And in here are four very sharp cutting blades. You also get ABS handle. And this is made so that these blades are interchangeable. And I find that it's a really tight fit. So you want to put them in and so that as you're handling them, you want to keep your fingers away because they're extremely sharp. And then when I take them all out, I'll kind of hold on to them like that and then kind of leverage them out because uh, they, they stay nice and tar tight. And so the tools that we have here, we'll kind of take them out and have a look at them. There's a very flattened U-gouge that is often referred to as a sweep. And that's really good for taking out large areas and creating textures. And then there is a nice U-gouge that goes very deep. And that's good for some lining and exceptionally good for texture. This is my all-purpose. This is probably the workhouse or workhorse of my set. It's a V-gouge or uh, a, a V-tool. And then there's a very nice uh, V-gouge for detailing. Now, <clears throat> when they come out of the package, they're extremely sharp. And so you can jump right in and start carving. But um, I have a set here that I've been using. And you'll find that as soon as you've done some carving, and it will also depend on what you're carving. If you're carving wood, that's going to take the edge off a little bit faster than if you're carving with linoleum, which is much more softer if you're using a hardwood, softwood. But you'll know as soon as you start carving and you notice they just uh, it's a little bit harder to, to push through, then you want to stop and you want to polish the blades. And so that's where the strop comes in. There's uh, the profiles for each one of the tools is made on this uh, wooden block. And this is an excellent polishing compound. So in order to, let's start with the V tool. I'm going to take some of the compound and I'm going to rub it on this little pyramid here. Okay. And then I'm going to put the tool down and I'm going to drag it towards me. I'm going to use a little bit of pressure. I'm going to drag it towards me. If you go the other direction, you're going to carve it up and then it's not going to be very serviceable. But what this does is this really polishes the inside edge of your tool. And the more it's polished and the less there are little cracks and, and nicks on an edge, the sharper it is. So that gets the inside. And then there's a little V groove here. And I'm going to put a little more of the compound here. And I want to hold the tool up so that it goes with the bevel of the polished edge here because I want to keep that as true as I can for better cutting and I just drag it towards me and after you do that you know it hardly takes any time to do that and we'll go back on top of that so that's going to keep your tools razor sharp now for the sweep the larger tool uh, that you can use for taking out large areas all Go ahead and be efficient here and I'll put it both on the groove and on the profile. Same thing, you want to hold it so that you drag it towards you. And then flip it over and hold it at the bevel, the angle of the bevel. And if you do that as you carve, then your tools are always going to be sharp. Okay, this is the U-gouge. And for the outside, I can either <clears throat> repeat using this one and rock it a little bit as I go across. And then there's another <clears throat> little groove here that I can continue to use to make sure that that conforms to this um, edge as well. And then there's also um, a similar profile 
for the smaller V gouge. So it's really important to keep these tools sharp and you'll have a much better time uh, with a carving and you'll be a lot happier with your prints. That being said, these are extremely sharp, so this is a good time probably to talk about safety. Um, you can imagine that if you have a sharp tool in your hand and you're not paying attention that uh, you could cause yourself some real serious damage. And so that's why I have what is referred to as a bench block. And this is a homemade thing. It's really simple to make. It's just a piece of plywood. And I have a one by two that I've attached at the bottom here. And then I have one by threes that I put at the top. And I keep it at a right angle because I'm also going to use this for lining prints up, uh, make sure I have even borders as well as if I decide to develop an image that has uh, multiple colors. All right now the principle is that with this one by two that is uh, at the bottom, if I push that forward, it's not going to go any farther. And if I take a wood block or a mounted linoleum block and I go that way, there's no reason for me to hold the block with a hand. And this is the, the prime rule. You do not put any fleshy part of your body in the direction of a cut because if you slip, then you're going to really, um, you're going to hurt yourself. Now, what I hold the tools, I mean, it's one of those things you'll have to kind of figure out for yourself what is the most comfortable way for you to hold it. But I have a tendency to hold the tool like this. And if you have both hands on the tool, it's really hard to cut yourself and you push away from yourself. And you'll also find that you, know, you can move <clears throat> the block in this direction and you still have plenty to hold on to it. So you don't have to worry about holding it like that and hurting yourself. So that's, you know, it's like the primary thing. Do not use a tool where you're cutting in the direction of any part of your body. Okay, now, when you are doing a relief print, the two traditional materials that you can use is either linoleum or wood block. And I'm going to use a three quarter inch piece of uh, birch plywood. And before I start cutting, I usually take India ink and I rub it into the surface of the wood so that when I make a cut, you can really see the difference between what's cut and what's not. And so it gives you a visual indication of how you're progressing. The first tool that we're going to use is the V gouge, the V tool, and I've already kind of cut one block here so that uh, give you some idea of what we're going to be doing. You can make visual transformations uh, from light to dark with keeping lines either very close together and thick or farther apart. You can also create a feeling of space by the way that you group your lines. So it isn't just a matter of removing the wood, but it's the way that you do it and the marks that each one of these tools make that will uh, give you uh, a visual effect that you're after. So just as far as handling a tool, I kind of hold it like a pencil to begin with, and then I use my other hand to help guide it. And if you have both hands on the tool, you're not going to cut yourself. And so don't dive bomb it. Um, a lot of beginners have a tendency to try to cut that way. You don't have any control over the tool and it's very dangerous to cut that way. So I would advise finding some way that you can have more control. I can push it and as soon as I want to stop, I stop. I don't suddenly go off and uh, ruin my cut. So I just kind of inch it forward, inch it forward. And you can tell it's a very sharp tool because of that little spiral of wood that comes out in front of it. Now, <clears throat> the way that the tool is shaped with a V gouge, the deeper it is in the wood, the wider the cut. So if I want to make that wider, then I just recut it. Don't try to uh, make it as wide as you need it right on the first bat. It's much better if you want it to be wider yet, then cut it again. So once I have that line, then I can decide if I put it over here, and another one over here that's going to be more like a, a darker tone, but if I position it so that it is a little bit closer to that one, then you can see the way that I'm starting to establish a surface and a direction. Okay. Now you can get the same effect with a smaller one, the smaller V gouge. And you may find that in the process of doing these prints that 
you know this is about the size of a print this is about five by seven four by six all right so that's a thinner line because the distance between the cutting edges closer together but this is my scale and you may decide that you want to do a woodcut that's four feet by eight foot on a piece of whole sheet of plywood in that case you're going to probably want to find bigger tools and so you might go to the flexcut.com website and take a look at all the profiles because there are many interchangeable blades that will work with this handle uh, for this this is kind of like the average um, scale that most people will want to be working on okay now as far as how deep to go in uh, by the time you make that cut that's deep enough you know you don't have to go all the way through the bottom of your block in order to uh, make it work out now in this case you can see the effect um, let me change the blade again and go back to my larger v gouge And I'm going to start kind of pulling it away a little bit, so it's going to get a little farther apart. And if you want to, you can work with the direction. So I can continue to get your eye to kind of follow, you know, like the perspective. Anything you can draw with a pencil, then you can also think that that is a similar thing that you can do with your cuts. I'm making lines. These are white lines on a black background. So you can have quite a control over it. It's brighter, and your eye blends that together, and you start seeing it kind of go off in another direction. Now, in this case, what I have done, <coughs> uh, and we'll do a similar thing here. I'll go ahead, and what I do too sometimes is I actually turn the wood as I cut. Again, make sure that you don't have your hands in the way. No. Come back in through there. All right, so this will be part of a circle, but then I can also define the edge by where I stop and start my lines. So I don't have to outline everything. And in most cases, you'll get a lot more life out of your images if you don't rely on outlining everything. <clears throat> so you can see what the general uh, process is in terms of using either the small or the large V gouge in order to create space. So in this case, with this one that I've already cut, the top has the highlight. I've cut that out entirely. I've used my sweep in order to help me with that one. I outline the boundaries of that shape and use the sweep to dig out uh, the excess. And then since this is a vertical plane, I carved in a vertical way and your eye groups that together as one side of that box. And then this side and the shadow I define by then making horizontal cuts because it's the ground plane and so you can see the way that that really can start to create space. And to me it's still very magical that you take these tools and with some cuts you've suddenly been able to create a space. All right, now let's switch from the V gouges and go to the U gouge and the sweep for these tool tools. And I have those on that side. <clears throat> and just very briefly before we start to cut, you can see that you can use them to create texture. You can use them to take out large areas. And you can also use them in a similar stippling effect so that in combination with the straightness and the regularity of a V-gouge, then you can create a feeling for um, shadow and light reflection using the U-gouge. So we'll flip this one over and we'll go over the use of this a little bit. Um, <clears throat> First, what I'm gonna do though, is I'm going to take a V gouge and I'm gonna pretend, let's say that I'm going to have that be the edge of my shape. I'm gonna make that a little bit deeper. Again, what you wanna do is kind of go over it a couple times instead of trying to get it the first time. So I just put the tip the V part of the gouge into the old line and use a little more pressure so it goes a little bit deeper. And now what I'm going to do is remove part of the background with my sweep. So <clears throat> by doing this, as I come forward with my sweep, I'm cutting to that line. As soon as I get there, that little piece of wood pops off. And so 
This enables me to have a really clean edge, whether it's the background or a shape. So I do that first with the V-gouge, and then I come up and clean the area out with the U-gouge, the sweep. Right? I can also create texture with this, and you can play around a little bit, like I can get <clears throat> quite a bit of a, a shape if I go a little bit deeper and then really let it elongate. I can get small bits. And if you kind of lift up at the end, it'll help get rid of that little wood burr. I'll get rid of that one there. And if I put them together closer, then the eye is going to see that as a brighter tone. And then as I start putting a little more space between it, the black of the background will darken that, and I can make the cuts a little bit smaller. At that point, I could jump in with my U-gouge. And I can get even smaller shapes. Okay, so <clears throat> I think that if you get a scrap block of wood to practice with, and you can start developing your own vocabulary of the shapes that you get by using the tool, and you get comfortable with what it takes to make the cuts. So in this case, I started with carving small U-gouge shapes out of it, and then I let the shape itself, the, the pattern of these marks, be consistent with that being round. So if you're trying to make a, a sphere, you don't want to make a bunch of marks going in straight direction, because that would then give you a circle. That would give you a flat geometric shape. So if you want something that is volumetric, then you want to follow the surface. So with a sphere, it's rounded, it's curved in all directions, so then those little marks that I've made with my U-gouge then show the contours and the surface of what I'm doing. And having things like a shadow that is part of the wood that isn't cut at all, that's created with uh, a nice contrast between the U-gouge shape and the shape that you would get horizontally that's a little bit more controlled with the V-gouge. You can play those two together and come up with some really lovely atmospheric looking things if that's what you want. Up and through here, I outlined that shape with the V-gouge and then use the U-gouge and cut to the line first and then once I had that established then <clears throat> I used both the sweep and this U-gouge to start making it look almost like there's some fire in the background of whatever that shape is. So now with the basic notion of how to use the tools let's put them together and actually create an image that we get very excited about. Okay, now we have to think about, uh, first of all, what are we going to use? Wood, linoleum. Uh, in this case, because it's going to be a little bit more detailed, I, I like working with linoleum. And you can either get linoleum pre-mounted on blocks, or you can buy it unmounted and cut it down to fit a block that you have. And it's just a matter of you know, putting some glue on it. I usually have like a little card that I kind of smooth it out. There's a burlap on the back of the linoleum, so you can put it on top, make sure all the edges are nice and lined up, and weight it down so that it dries nice and flat and you're set to go. So whether you're using a pre-mounted block or you mount your own blocks, then uh, that's all that you really need to worry about to get started. So I know that this block is five by seven, and another thing that I do before I really start working on the block is I tend it uh, like a kind of a medium value color. This kind of uh, reddish orange color works out great. I just take some acrylic, uh, squirt a little bit there, take a, a rag and really work it in so you're staining it. I don't want it to build up a film or a thickness, but I want to stain the block so that when I cut it, I still get a nice contrast between the color of the linoleum and this reddish color and the reason I do that rather than coat it black is that if it's black and I want to draw on it with something that's black, it's a little too subtle for my eyes. So this way I can draw on it and things will show up 
And then when I cut that, then I can tell what I've cut away and what remains, which is essentially the essence of developing the image. Now you can draw directly on the block. I do that a lot. You know, I can just do something very gestural. This is a brush pen that really gives kind of a nice uh, thickness of line that would be something I know I could cut. Then I can come back with a slightly thinner one that I could think about perhaps for a little cross hatching, build up some of those tones. But in this case, I had a specific sketch. I'll move these out of the way here. Came up with a specific sketch, and it's a little fish wearing a top hat, and I thought that was amusing, and that would give me an opportunity to develop some texture and uh, have some fun with my tools and my linoleum. So I took that and I scanned it up to scale to the five by seven, and then I took a piece of vellum and I put it down on top of that copy, and I came up with with this. So this is kind of the enlargement, I refined it a little bit, and I'll go back over that with my pens to try to tighten things up, but I don't want to go into insane detail because I'm not doing a drawing. I want to get enough of this drawn so then it gives me something to transfer onto my block. And so at this point, I will take another piece of vellum and a nice soft graphite crayon and I make my own graphite transfer paper. So I'll take my block. <laughs> and I will position my image. Now this is important to notice. If I want my print to look like that at the, at the very end of it, I want to make sure that I put it on the block like that. And this is critical when you're using letters and numbers because if you put a number down on your block and carve it out so it reads correctly, when you ink that up and print it, the print will make that backwards. So if it's essential to your composition and your sense of well-being for that fish to be looking in that direction, then I have to put it on the block that way. Um, as it is, I like to reverse things and see what the other uh, side of my brain is doing by reversing my images. So I position it like that, and then I will put the graphite paper that I've made. I'll lift that up gently. You could tape. You can tape it so it doesn't move to make sure that you get the registration. And then if you take a, uh, like an HB or an F pencil, then I use a little bit of pressure. And as I am pressing down, that is transferring the graphite from that vellum onto my block. And so I can reproduce the block or the image on the block. And then this is where I start coming back with my pens and I will decide, okay, I'm going to make that line kind of thick and in order to get kind of a nice organic feel to it, then maybe I will thicken it. So you can really work out your design um, a little more completely once you have the graphite transfer. And again, you know, how much you need, it depends on how inventive you want to be in the process. You know, if I decide that I want to get some toning in there, I can cross hatch. So you can work the entire block out before you start to carve it. Um, so I've already done that ahead of time to save some effort. And so in this case, you can see that this is the translation <clears throat> of the image. Uh, you know, I changed the proportion a little bit. And then I used the cross hatching technique with this finer pen to get a feeling for tonality in the waves and then the lines that are his tail here are a little bit bolder. I have a tendency to make the lines on the outside a little thicker and the cross hatching a little thinner. And all of this I believe uh, to be within my range of cutting ability. And it is my style, uh, you know, cross hatching, that type of thing. You might do something that is very high contrast and black and white, you know, you just have to develop your own sense of aesthetic, the more experience you have, maybe the more detail you go for, or you might decide that it's uh, a lot more interesting to do things with uh, a little more high contrast. But at this point, now, I've got the block, I have the image laid out, and so it's just a matter of translating that in terms of the cuts I'm going to make with either the V-gauge or the U-gauge. Okay, I've got, I got Mr. Fish. We're ready to go, um, so I'm going to start to carve, and I think the first thing I'm going to do is start working on 
let's say the belly. So I'm going to take my V gouge and I'm going to outline that. So I'm just going on the inside of the line that I drew. And you see this is linoleum so it's cutting very nicely. And I spin the block a little bit as I cut. You'll notice that I do not have my hand in front. And then when I get to that edge there, I'll let that pop off a little bit. And then they come in the other direction. Pop that a little bit. And again, you just need to go down about no more than an eighth of an inch. And I will stop it there. Now what I'll do is take my sweep and I'll hold it. And now I'm going to clear that out. So I am holding on to it. And again, if I get both hands on it, I can kind of inch it forward or millimeter it forward. So I'm not suddenly losing control of it and having it scar up uh, the rest of my image. And as I come up to where I scored it with the V gouge, then it pops off and I have a real nice clean edge. Now, I can see where I'm going to get my cross hatching going with uh, the V gouge here in a minute. So I'm going to come up to the border of that and I'm going to continue to clear. Okay. And I want to give a little bit of space because I might get a little inventive when I get the old V tool out. But for the most part now, I have cleared out. So whatever I cut out is not going to print because it's below the surface. And when I put ink on with a roller, it'll only deposit ink on the top part of the block. And so if you cut something below the surface, then it's not going to print. All right, now what I want to do is start working on some of that cross hatching, but I've been using the V tool quite a bit. So right before I do that, I'm going to just take, it just takes so little time to give an extra little polish to your tool and you get much better results. And so every, you know, every so often, again with linoleum, you're going to hold a sharp edge a little bit longer than when you cut with wood. But in any case, I want to make sure I've got the sharpest tool I can because I want to make some real fine cuts here. Okay, now I sharpened my V tool and I'm going to start making parallel cuts. And I'm going to curve them a little bit because the belly is rounded a little bit. And I barely am putting any pressure. I don't want to go down there very deeply because I want thin lines. Now the, the only thing that will happen is that when I'm inking this up, I have to make sure that I don't over ink. If I put real goopy ink and not paying attention, then these shallow cuts may fill up with ink and I'll lose the detail. But as long as I'm careful about my inking, then I can get away with these very shallow cuts. So I'm going along the contour, the belly of the fish. Come up and through here. Now this may be a little bit of a hard edge that I have developed with the end, the starting, the beginning of those lines as they continue. So I might come back with my sweep and I'll kind of soften them a little bit so that they aren't quite all lined up. Now the other thing that I have too is that uh, you might notice that, hey, I've got three, four blades and I have three or four handles. You can get extra handles, and I find, you know, if you go to the flexcut.com, in addition to getting more blades, you can actually get more handles. And I find that that is well worth it for me because I get a little annoyed if I have to keep on, you know, I'm ready to use the U-gouge, and it's like, oops, i got to switch blades. I mean, it's fine, but I like the luxury of having more than one handle. All right, so I'm, I'm kind of half-toning this. I'm kind of giving it a little bit of shading, a little bit of a, a roundness by the way that I'm cutting this. And then I'm going to make even finer lines for the, uh, this section in through here. So I'm going to switch to my other V gouge. And so it goes from highlight to mid-tone 
to more shadow area. And then I'm going to let these kind of fade out a little bit. I'll put fewer of them a little farther apart. And then that will lead into the black of the shadow underneath his little fin there. And I think with relief, it's really good to think about the balance between white and black and tone. So you don't want it to completely carve over the entire surface because then it's way too much texture. Um, you want to get kind of a nice balance between solid blacks and large white areas and then the intermediate textures and tones that you use to uh, define things. So I've got that going. I could come back and again maybe think about in the background. All right, this time I will use my V gouge and I will go on the outside of the line. And then I can come around here, stop it, and then that piece will pop out when I start cutting that. And I like keeping both hands on the tool. You have more control. All right, now this may be a little bit uh, narrow for my sweep. I have to be a little clever in using that, so I will pick out my U gouge here, which is just the right size, and I will take that out. So now I'm starting to develop the background. All right now, <clears throat> I can also use the U gouge here not just for plowing things out, but I can actually use it for a texture. And so the back of the fish is going to be scaly. So I'm digging in and then I kind of pull it to the left and it starts giving me kind of a nice texture similar to scales and so maybe I'll get the back part done like there's usually a highlight there. I'll follow it down the curve of the back. All right, And then I'll kind of go starting about halfway up there and then I'll do the same thing there and then up like that and then up like that. So I'm digging in and then I'm kind of scratching and pulling apart to give that particular shape, kind of like a, a water drop shape. And then I can bring it in a little bit and maybe make it a little smaller and fewer of them and then really hold back a little bit. So as it comes into the fish, it goes from highlight to darker area. And so grouping marks like that and the difference between the kind of cross hatching parallel lines you can get with a fine V gouge and then here I've got the U gouge and I'm kind of coming up with this nice organic feel. I mean I think it really has kind of a nice way of developing a sense of the texture of a fish with the scales. And then if I come back with this and I decide, okay, now I'm going to work with a fin, and I want to get the sense of it being kind of a spiny thing or a material that is of that nature, then I can come back with this. And I, I like that contrast between these lines and the texture that I created with the U gouge. This seems to be consistent with the way that this fish is constructed. So I will continue working on this, and it's, it's fun to see an image evolve this way, and it's extremely therapeutic. I love cutting the blocks, but as soon as I have this cut, then it is even more fun to try to see what it looks like when I print it. Okay, I'm done cutting the fish. I've done all the uh, hard work, and so I've cleaned the block just to show you what it looks like when you have all the cutting done, and it's kind of looks like a negative image. So, uh, not sure if it's going to be perfect, and what I can do, just to check it out, is take a piece of tracing paper and my graphite stick, and if I want to, I can take a rubbing of it, just to see if there's anything I missed, if there's anything that I should know about before I start printing on my expensive printmaking paper. So, um, I can look at it, you know, obviously do the whole thing and say, oh, it's perfect, time to go. All right, so uh, first thing, I want to make sure that I've got my paper all set to go. 
I use uh, mulberry paper. It's uh, a lot of times they're called Asian papers. Uh, uh, they used to be known as rice paper. But they're actually made from mulberry and other natural fibers. And they're very resilient. They're very tough. They're very absorbent. And they are also very thin. So they're just beautiful paper. I shy away from any hard paper because it is harder to get a good impression that way. And I've gone to all this effort to try to make something that I like and I don't want to uh, use the wrong kind of paper. So I use uh, mulberry paper. And I wanna make sure that I have several inches. So if I look at the size of my paper, it's nine by 12 with a five by seven block. And it gives you one or two inches all the way around. Don't cut on a, print on a piece of paper that's hardly going to give you any borders because it's going to get dirty and you'll have a hard time lining it up and all that. So give yourself the luxury of some good borders. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ink up, roll the block, and I'm going to use my bench block also to help me print. And so that if I take this paper and I more or less line it up to the edges of my block, then that's going to keep everything parallel and it'll give me fairly even borders. So uh, we're all set with that. All right, for the key image like this, I have a tendency to like using an oil-based relief ink. And it isn't the ink itself that is that toxic. It is if you clean up with mineral spirits. So I have an alternative to that. So there's a little piece of wax paper here to keep the ink from scumming and drying up. I use a spatula and you don't want to dig into the ink and make these little pot holes in there because that'll dry up and you'll have scummy ink and it'll be drive you nuts. So instead what you do is just skim the top off and I have a piece of glass that I'm using as my inking slab. And so a couple of little moderate strips of ink here will do it. Put that evenly on there. I'll put that off to the side. And then this is called a brayer. It's got a roller and a handle, spins, and this is what you use to roll up. And technical information about where to get some of these supplies or some that I would recommend, uh, we'll have on the flex cut website. So when I roll out, I put it down maybe once or twice and then pick it up again and put it down. Otherwise you put ink there, put ink there, and you don't have anything in between. And then I go across this way because you want a thin but an even covering of ink. Okay, let's ink this up a couple times this way. You don't want to over ink but you definitely want enough ink on the surface to transfer times. Um, you might notice that maybe in the background you're picking up a little static. You can decide whether you like it or not. If you don't like it and you catch it ahead of time, then you can take a rag and kind of clean that up. Okay, but it has a little sheen to it. I will hold the paper up and go along the top edge and then let it fall down. And I usually kind of press it down a little bit just to kind of get it to stick so it doesn't slide around. Then I'll take my vellum and put on top of it and you can either use a wooden spoon so you can uh, cook and print with the same utensils, although I wouldn't recommend that. And you can see that, that the ink is starting to come through the paper. The paper is thin enough that if you get good pressure and good coverage Everything's doing it's supposed to. You can start seeing the image come through. I use what's called a baron. This one has little nubs on it. So it's like lots of little spoons. Make sure that the edges print, but you don't want to keep on falling off the edge because that may tear your paper. Put a little pressure on with the other hand to make sure that the paper is not shifting and moving. Good exercise. You don't have to go to the gym now. All right, so what I'll do is carefully lift this up, and you can see the way that the ink came through. And if I spot an area that may not be quite dark enough, then I can come back and really focus on it. 
Right. And I can also keep the paper down and lift it up and make sure it looks okay, which it does. And so this is the impression that is made from the block that we cut. You can see the patterns that were created with the U-gouge and then the hap toning with the V-gouge, and so it looks, looks pretty good. It's a snappy looking fish. It must be red snap, right? So um, I can decide to print more if I want. I've got the slab, and it's just a matter of re-inking the block, putting more paper down, and going through the same process. About every other print, I might put just a little bit more ink down on top to make sure I get plenty of ink, but I don't want to over ink. I definitely want, don't want to over ink. Now for cleanup, you know, let's say I printed everything that I need to do, I'm finished, then to clean the oil-based ink up, I just use uh, salad oil, and I put it down on top of it, but before that I will scrape the ink off as much as I can with my spatula. And this ink is usually beet. I wouldn't try to save this. Whatever is left over, um, I'm willing to sacrifice that to the print gods. And once I get the bulk of the ink cleaned up, then I will put some vegetable oil down on my slab. I put it in these little squeeze bottles to control how much I put out. Then I will take the brayer and I will move it over the slab. So I cover the entire slab, so that gives me an opportunity to clean the brayer and the slab at the same time. And then just take some rags, or in this case, these are the shop towels that you can get. And that's just a matter of taking the excess ink off. So once I get most of the ink off, I might hit it with just a little more vegetable oil. And it usually leaves just a slight film of vegetable oil. And so then I'll finish up with some glass cleaner on the slab and on the brayer as well as the spatula. And I'm ready for the next round.